Welcome, welcome back. I promise you that the next session is going to be about storytelling, about what it takes to plan a fantastic picture, fantastic portraits, and tell a story in one shot. And who else could be better explain that than our friend Cassandra? And I'm sure that many of you know already her work, which is just fabulous. You saw just a few minutes ago, I was sharing some of these incredible pictures and uh, we will talk more about that. Maureen, I see that you're trying to look <laughs> from the camera. Uh, please introduce the lovely Cassandra to our audience. Oh, it would be my pleasure to introduce Cassandra Jones from Noel Mirabella Photography, located in Alberta, Canada. However, I really think she doesn't need an introduction because she has so many fans tuning in today, Dario. Um, and I'm also excited for all of you to learn more about Cass's work, which is defined as both um, whimsical and magical. And, and you're going to see shortly. Um, and I'm so fortunate to have some examples of your work, Cass, in our showroom. When we have visitors it, it, that see your work, it stops them in their tracks. And I just want to thank you for the gift that you provide your clients and, and the inspiration that you give our industry. And you know, before we jump into the master class with Cass, uh, I know 2020 has created a little bit of a slower timeline for, for many projects and, you know, including, you know, some of the projects that we're working on at, at Graphy, although we'll be full steam ahead here shortly. Um, and there's, you know, there's only so much one can do with social distancing, but I want all of you to know that at the end of Cass's program, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the dry mounts that we're working on with Cass. I know you're very eager as we are to see this program come to fruition. Um, so let's jump into it. Today's program with Cass is gonna be on storytelling photography and Cass will help all of you discover the art and power of storytelling in photography and ways in which channeling your voice through your phot photographs can really change the world that we live in. And you're gonna see that and experience that when you see Cass's work. So Cass, thank you a million times over and over again for, for sharing your knowledge with us and for all of your support with Graphy Studio. We adore you. So let's welcome Cass, thank you. Thank you, Maureen, I adore you more. Thank you so much for having me. I am so, so excited to be here. Um, I'm going to go into screen share here really quick and just get my presentation up. Just give me one second. Let's see if you guys can all see me. All right, I'm going to move my little video. Yay, okay, we are ready to start. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for inviting me to come speak. I love Graphy. I was really, really excited to, for the opportunity to speak at Imaging USA on behalf of this amazing team and this amazing lab that I love so much. When Maureen asked me to come and speak for Graphy for Imaging USA, she told me I could speak about basically whatever I want, which was music to my ears. And I thought after the year we've had, uh, last year in particular, um, you guys are gonna have so many incredible instructors that are gonna teach you all about running a successful business and pricing yourself and marketing and selling and finding your dream client. And I just wanted to come on here and talk to you about why we're here in the first place. I wanted to talk to you about the power in what we do and the service we offer to the world. So I think we are living in extraordinary times and I know we've heard that, but I'm gonna talk about it from a different perspective, um, not pandemic related. We are living at, in such an extraordinary period in history where we have access to people all over the world, all over the globe. We have this unprecedented access to people and places that we haven't really experienced before. I mean, if we look back, 50 years ago or 70 years ago, we didn't have access to the same number of people that we have now. And we largely have social media to thank for that. When I look at you know, our social media platforms and when I'm putting my work out into the world, I am often picturing a stage. And however many people you have supporting your work, I don't like to call them fans. I like to call them, I don't like to call them followers either. I like to call them supporters. Um, all of the people that kind of rally around us and support our work and follow our journey, every single time we take an image, 
And every single time we utter a single sentence and put it out into the world on social media, we are essentially standing on a stage and we are speaking to 500 people, 1,000 people, 50,000 people, 100,000 people. We are standing up and we are sending a message out into the world. And I guess I would like to encourage all of you to think about the message that you are sending, to think about what you are projecting and, and the work and the values that you're putting out there and think about your stage and think about the message that you wanna to send to the world, which I think is what we do every single day in our work and what we're putting out into the world. Um, give me one second, there we go. Um, I approach my work from a couple different angles. I have my client work and I have my personal projects. My client work is very much centered on just telling individual stories and preserving legacies for people that are in my local communities and people that travel to me for sessions. It is incredible, incredible what I have learned about people and just the ways in which we kind of move through the world and the ways that we exist in the world. And my clients are often coming to me because they want just a beautiful family portrait of their little, their little babies or their children or their families. Or sometimes they're coming to me because they have a, have a cheeky story they wanna tell or there's just part of their family legacy or something that makes them unique or something that makes them themselves, they want to capture and put into photographs, something that they can hang on to forever. Sometimes they come to me because they just have something deeper that they're working through and they need something tangible to help them come to the other side. So I approach my work from all different angles. It's all amazing. It's all equally valuable to me. I am taking my clients hopes and dreams and wishes and their thoughts and just all of the little nuances of experiences, everything that creates these beautiful humans that I work with and how, how, they, how they project themselves out into the world. And I am trying to put it all together in a way that shows who they are as people. Sometimes it's simple, sometimes it's um, easier than others. And sometimes I really have to tap into my inner creative and pull out all the stops to tell stories that I really have to think about because I haven't necessarily been in that position or in, you know, the, the place and time that they're in. This is <laughs> the perfect example of the latter. Um, just having to tap into my inner creativity. Mom came to me, her daughter has been tube fed, well, she was tube fed the first two years of her life. And she came to me sort of at the tail end of that journey. This little girl was doing so well and she was on solid food and only being tube fed just part of the time. And her mom asked me if I would create something that would honor those first two years and also allow her to kind of close that chapter so that they could move on with their lives. So. I thought and thought about it and I came up with Fed is Best and it basically just celebrates how she has individually thrived in the world but also sends a message that a fed baby is a happy baby regardless of the method and if any of you have followed the bottle feeding versus breastfeeding debate or <laughs> um, I don't even want to say controversy but there is this kind of push and pull that we think that we know what is best for children. And traditionally we say that, you know, breast is best and all of that stuff and breastfeeding is great, but it doesn't make it easy for people that end up having to formula feed or choose to formula feed and, you know, society putting shame on them for the choices that they make. So there was this whole fed is best mantra that was put out into the world just, just to, prov to promote um, the fact that a fed baby is a happy baby and I wanted to have a little play on that and kind of contribute to the idea that as long as we are helping our babies thrive in the world and we are doing what we think is best for them that is ultimately the best choice that we can make and everybody's choices and everybody's experiences might be a little bit different. My personal projects are more internally derived they're inspired by my life and my experiences this is actually a self-portrait of myself with my son that I took last year in March. And they are internally derived, but they definitely carry the same message. And I am putting this work out into the world as a way of speaking up, as a way of 
I guess just telling people that they're not alone and that, you know, there's other people in the world that might be experiencing and feeling the same things that they are. And I, I honestly think that is one of the most powerful things that we can do as photographers in our work and in the stories that we tell through our images is project something out there that people can relate to and people can feel connected to so that they are not just, I don't know, feeling isolated and disenfranchised in the places that they're in. This is one of my favorite images. I called it triumphant heart. This little guy had open heart surgery just a few months old and I photographed him. He was less than a year old here. I think he was 10 months and I use a lot of symbolism in my work. So I stitched the little bear's chest in unison with his scar and he's in kind of a little heart shape in the blanket and his arms are raised quite triumphantly because he is a survivor. He's a strong little bub. And um, when I put these images out into the world and when I'm shooting these things, this is my way of, I guess, promoting the human experience in a way like we don't we have we all have things that we go through we all have things that are maybe not so easy and things that are delightfully wonderful and it's really important that when we put them out into the world that we see a, a balance there that people can connect to one of my absolute favorite projects that I've been doing the last year is just working with the elderly and I have learned some really incredible things working with people that have been on this earth way longer than I have. And that is that life on this earth is peculiar in the sense that we spend our entire lives trading our precious minutes for dollars so that we can buy things and we can live in a house that keeps us in one place. When in reality, home is where our people are and things that matter aren't really things at all because things don't kiss us on the forehead before we fall asleep at night and they don't wrap their arms around us for all of the reasons or no reasons at all. And I think this is why people that lose, you know, their belongings and everything that they own to a fire like this little girl or a natural disaster or a state of war or something like that, that they will tell you that it isn't the stuff that they miss it's the memories. And that is because those memories are tied to people. They are tied to people that we love. They are tied to those people that used to wrap their arms around us. And they're tied to those people that used to kiss us on the forehead as we fall asleep. And it is those memories that carry us. And sometimes those memories are all we have left of those people. And that is why um, I think images and photographs are so important. They are a documentation of our lives. They are a documentation of our legacy, of our stories, of the things that we value and the things that are meaningful to us. And they are a record. And most of us, you know, we are not avid writers. We're not documenting our daily lives in words. Some of us are, some of us aren't, but we do have our photographs as a daily record to prove <laughs> our existence in this world and, and the way that we move through it. And I think that's why when we lose people, I don't know if you guys um, have ever lost anyone or lost a fur baby or anyone that's been really special to you. For me, one of the first things I do is I like frantically go back through my hard drives and my computer and I'm trying to find any image, any picture, any memory, anything that will trigger the memories that I had with this person or this being, because that's what I have. Like when that person is gone, those are the things that we have left and we, and we cling to them. We don't wanna lose them. Photographs tell our story. They tell our individual story, but they also go beyond that. If we go beyond the microcosm of our individual lives, they tell the story of the world. They tell the story of humanity. They tell the story of our triumphs and our loves and our successes and all of our ways of moving forward and doing better. And they tell the stories of our destruction as a species and our disasters and our shortcomings and all of the ways in which we failed. And they do this perhaps as a means of <laughs> encouraging us to do better and, and correct the error of our ways. And if we look back at all of the photographs since cameras were invented or even illustrations and paintings before that, we see the story of the world. We see the story of humanity. We see things that sometimes we wish we could unsee. 
I think just looking back on photos of concentration camps during World War II are a perfect example of that. We have the opportunity to learn. Rosa Parks sitting at the front of a city bus, you know, we take from that, we learn from that, and we use it to fuel ourselves to do better, hopefully, in a perfect world. So our stories are telling the story of humanity and the world. And here is the thing about stories that I will tell you today. They are a force that is so much more powerful than money or gold could ever be. There is so much value in our stories. Money doesn't buy hope. It doesn't buy connection. It doesn't buy inspiration. It doesn't buy belonging. Money doesn't buy love. It doesn't buy empathy. But stories, people rise up when they hear stories. People, people are inspired to do better when they hear stories. People are inspired to do things that they didn't even know were possible, that they're inspired to dream dreams that they, they didn't even know they could dream when they hear stories. They are inspired to put one foot in front of the other and they're inspired to live. And I don't mean just live. I mean like really, truly live. Stories are like the cradle of humanity in my perspective. And I think this is why I am so incredibly passionate about telling stories in my work. And I think that's why you should consider <laughs> um, incorporating storytelling into your work as well. We, we can't help it. No matter what image we take, we are telling a story, but I really encourage you to think about what it is, what, what the story is that you're telling. Life is a collection of stories. That's how I view our lives on this earth. It is a collection of experiences and stories and it is a collection of everything that makes us into the beautiful humans that we are all of our flaws and all of our amazingness and it, they encapsulate all of our most exuberant incredible joyous highs and all of the pain that cripples us in our darkest moments and at the end of our lives that is that is kind of what we are that is the that is our legacy is our stories and our experiences and the love that we sprinkle out into the world and the way we make people feel. Because that's what lingers at the end of the day is the way we make people feel and the way, um, the way we love and the good that we put out into the world. And the beautiful thing is that we are all unique, but we're all connected at the same time. I think that we all tend to value much of the same things, even though we express those values differently or very differently at times. And a lot of the division in our world and, you know, between cultures and countries and people even within our own cities and towns is a lack of recognition for the fact that actually we all share the same common values, the same core values. We all value love and connection and family and we all value freedom and we all value, value safety and security and we value having our basic needs met. We value, you know, having shelter and having food in our bellies. We value these things. And if we can recognize that we all value the same things, um, I think the world would come together quite a bit. And this is where our photographers come in. We are a mirror for the world. We are a mirror for the world. We show people what is good. We show people what is valuable. We show people what is true. We show people what is worthy of being in front of our lens and being in front of our camera and what is worthy of being projected back out into the world. We put so much emphasis on the media, TV, commercials, movies, etc., for having negative impacts on society for, um, you know, promoting unrealistic body expectations for women or glorifying toxic male masculinity or glorifying violence when in reality, yes, that is true. The media is responsible for a lot of those things. Um, and yes, we do need change, but I consider photographers like a grassroots level media, if you will. We are representing people in our local communities in our cities, in our regions, in our towns, in our provinces, in our counties, in our countries. We're representing people and we are mirroring back to people what we deem valuable, what we deem good, what we deem true, what we deem worthy. And we have to be so careful in that. And we, I think we have an ethical responsibility to show up and represent and to think about what we're putting out there and what we're putting out into the world. What we hear 
day in and day out actually alters our values, our perception, and how our brain develops over time. And that means that photographers actually play a role in shaping how we view our world and the people in it. You are actually altering <laughs> how people view the world and how their brains develop. You are actually altering our perception of people in the world. And you are altering, in that sense, you are altering the course of history by what you're putting out into the world because you have a stage and you have access to people and people are looking at you and they are looking at you to set the tone and to show them the way. And we have a responsibility in that. If we only show one side of humanity, we run the risk of disenfranchising the entire rest of the world. And that is a very, very dangerous thing as we know. We have to show up and represent, we have to. We have the power to invoke societal change. We have the power to invoke change. We have the power to alter the course of history. We have to make it count. And this is where you shine, my friends. This is, this is where you shine. Take all of the things that make you you, take all of your experiences, all of the little nuances of yourself, everything that you have carried with you in life, all of the good things, all of the not so good things, all of the painful things, and channel them out into the world. Give people something to relate to. Put them out into your work. The world needs you. It needs your perspective. It needs some variation in how we're mirroring things back out into the universe so that people feel united and connected. Um, I lost my daughter nine years ago. And I was in a really, really, really dark place. I was, I actually just felt like I was dead with her. Like I completely died. I ceased to exist. And I remember sitting at my mother's house one day and I was sitting at her dining room table. My mom was in the kitchen. My stepdad was sitting at the table with me. I don't remember why I was there, but I remember feeling like the world had moved on without me. Like everybody had just moved on. And I wasn't in that room. I wasn't in you know, this space on earth, I was like hovering somewhere above it and everything was going so quickly beneath me and I just was lost. And I was sad, like so unbearably sad and so broken. And I remember my stepdad said to me, you are so lucky. I said, excuse me? He said, you are so lucky. Not very many people in the world get to experience such a pure sorrow. Sorry, I'm a very emotional person, so I will probably tear up at least three more times. Um, I have carried that with me every day. I know exactly what he meant. I know that he didn't mean, oh, yay, you, your daughter just died. He meant that my experience and the depth of my feelings allowed me to walk in other people's shoes and develop an empathy like I have never known before. And it's not as if I wasn't an empathetic person before. I am definitely an empath, born and true, but it allowed me to go beyond myself so much more. And I think I have carried that with me and channeled it into my work so much, that ability to be able to walk in somebody's shoes and empathize with what they're going through and put it into my work and put it out into the world so that other people don't feel so alone. I remember I felt very alone after I lost my daughter. She was stillborn. And for any of you who know anything about stillbirth, um, I actually did my master's thesis on disenfranchisement and feelings of isolation in bereaved parents following stillbirth because society doesn't consider it a real loss. You know, your baby didn't live outside of your womb. You give birth to a dead child. So for the parents, they experience a level of grief that is identical to you know, the same level of grief as if you lose a living child, but society doesn't recognize it. So you're very disenfranchised and lonely and you end up lacking the support that you need. Um, that vein of thought and inspiration I have carried into my work in every aspect because no matter what the story I'm telling, whether it's my story or somebody else's, I don't want people to feel alone. I want them to have a connection point. Now, storytelling does not always have to be deep. It doesn't always have to be emotional. It doesn't have to make you cry. Um, it can be fun. It can be light. It can be airy. It can be funny. It can be a lot of different things. Sometimes it can be as simple as 
all of the ways in which we tuck our little babies into bed are all equally beautiful. Or that all bodies, no matter the size, shape, round, straight, skinny, curvy, pear, circle, any color under the sun or any age, they're all beautiful. Every single one of them. You guys are all stunning. This um, body positivity project I've been working on totally blew my mind because I just wanted to, I wanted to put it out there because I feel like I get a lot of people that ask me to photograph their kids, but when it comes to family pictures, they don't want them. And I actually had a mom who lost nine babies in between her first and second child who called me one day and she said, oh, I'd love for you to take a family picture for me. Um, I have this idea. I really want you to do. I was like, sweet. Okay, cool. I'm listening. And she said, well, I want you to photograph just our eyes, like around this level, just one, two, three, four, mom, dad, two kids. And I want it to be like, you know, a long photo, but just our eyes. And I was like, sweet, cool. I can definitely do that. Um, love that my clients are coming to me with their own ideas and bringing some flavor to the session. And then I got talking about, you know, I really wish more moms would get in the frame. And so many people are so body conscious after they have kids, they don't want to be photographed. And she was like, oh, I'm so glad you said that. She said, I wanted to get a family photo with my family, but I mean, I just, the reason I asked you to photograph just our eyes is because I actually don't want my body to show because I'm too fat. And I was like, whoa. So you mean to tell me that you lost nine babies in between the two kids that you have, and now you have a family and your family is complete, but you feel too fat to be in the photo? That's on us people. That's on us. We need to represent, we need to show up, we need to photograph people, all people, every kind of every kind of person that exists so that people feel like they are worthy enough to be photographed and get in the frame. So that inspired this project. Um, I photograph all bodies, all bodies, they're all equally valuable. A lot of people comment and they're like, finally, a real woman, you know? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, we're all real women. <laughs> you know, you, you're not just real if you have curves. You're real no matter what. You're real no matter what your body looks like. You're gorgeous. You're beautiful. So if you have parts missing, that's okay. You're still absolutely flawlessly gorgeous, no matter who you are or where you come from. Um, aging. I feel like we undervalue our elderly population. You know, there's a lot of elder abuse that goes on. We... I don't know what's up with us, you guys. And I'm talking like North American culture here, but I feel like, you know, old age homes are, are underfunded and people are undercared for. And if you talk to people that are working on the ground, they will say the same thing. Um, when I photographed Helen, I photographed her with this beautiful little baby. You saw the picture earlier. And originally it started out as a women's studies project, but then I, I brought her there and I was like, no, that's not her. We're going to do this with this little baby. We're going to do a generational project. I want to show, you know, kind of a passing of the torch. Helen lived on this earth for a hundred years. She's experienced so much. And now the next generation is going to take over. And as she held this baby, she went inside of herself. Like she was so, I could just see her going back into her bank of memories and holding her own babies. She kept asking me, can I unwrap the baby? Can I look at her? Can I touch her skin? I just want to touch her skin. And I was like, yes, Helen, of course you can. And she just, she enjoyed it so much. It brought her so much joy, but she had a bit of a wrist issue and she couldn't hold her for very long. And as soon as we took the baby out of her arms, she started to cry. And that was the real story. It wasn't Helen and the baby. It wasn't the joy that the baby brought her. It was, Helen was lonely. She told me that her friends were dead and most of her kids were dead. And she was lonely. She was incredibly lonely. She sobbed and sobbed in my studio because she was lonely. I ended up just holding her hand and talking to her most of the time that she was there. And that is the real story. This is like the reality that I want to put out there. It's, it's, there's a beauty in it, but we need to do better. And I think if we continue to tell these stories, we will, sorry, we will do better. It could be something deeper. This is a socio-political statement on the oppression of women that was totally inspired by my life as a young woman and a young single mother. I don't want to go into the, de the details of this image, but I will say that everything is symbolic. Um, every word, every book title, every item, even the website that is actually my stomach in that picture. <laughs> um, 
And this is probably one of the most impactful things that I've ever created and something that has spoken to so many people all around the world, regardless of socio-political status, socio-economic status, regardless of language. This image has communicated with women and men all over the world, regardless of where they come from and regardless of whether or not they share my spoken language, which is in Incredible. These are the ways in which we can use our voice. More projects on women, on the weight of motherhood, on the sometimes perceived isolation or darkness that can come, but the light that comes from within. This is a little bit lighter. Um, this is actually the first time anybody has seen an edited image from this series. This was inspired by my experience as a mom with my second daughter. I was so overjoyed to have a baby that was alive that I could take home and hold and hug and love forever that was my little girl and I was so in love with every second of my life at that point in time that I used to like wash her clothes but they weren't allowed to be with the adult clothes because the adult clothes would contaminate the cute little baby clothes so she had her own little pile and I would wash them and then I would iron every dress every shirt and every little tiny pair of pants. She was like four pounds, 11 ounces. When I took her home, her clothes were like, like little miniature doll clothes. I would iron them and I would put them in her little armoire and I would dress her like five different times a day. And I was just in heaven. And that's not to say that I don't understand that motherhood has its dark moments. You saw the pictures earlier. Um, my son that I had after my daughter, I had terrible postpartum depression and I wasn't able to breastfeed him. He couldn't do it physically. So I pumped every two hours for a year, it was hell. And it was like just trying to claw my way through the next day. But there's a devotion in there. There's a love in there. And I wanted to show that in this image. So this mom is, she's at a vintage wash tub and everything is made of flowers, her cape, the baby's bed, the clothes on the window are all made of fresh flowers. And the blanket that she's washing is made of fresh flowers as well. And she's doing laundry. And we kind of joked as we were shooting that, I was like, Larissa, that's the name of the mom. I was like, soft hands, soft fingers, a little bend in your wrist, look serene. Like how we all look when we're doing chores and laundry. And we had a good laugh because we know that it's work. We know that household chores are work, but I wanted to show a different side. I wanted to show the devo devotion and the unconditional love of motherhood. And I feel like that is what this shows. This um, story was inspired by my mother who used to go outside and shear the sheep and spin the wool and make socks and mittens and take them to market because I grew up in the middle of nowhere and that's what we did. I grew up in a log house that my parents, you know, cut the logs down from our farm with their own two hands and built the house. And um, it was just a slower, less shiny, less fast paced way of life where it was just quiet and it was hard working, but it was honest. And I feel like times have changed definitely in my life. And I wanted to go back to a simpler time with this series. Every image is inspired by something. It is telling a story. And children, which is kind of where my heart is, babies and kids, often I'm just showing the world I want to live in. I am showing you guys that I think childhood is completely full of wonder and magic. And kids are, children are like the most magnificent creatures on planet earth. <laughs> I will fight you tooth and nail <laughs> if you say otherwise. Um, they are just everything. Like children are creative and they're intelligent and they're so resourceful. They will play with, they don't need a toy from the store to have a good time. If you have a cardboard box and a pile of rocks, they're good. They are a little bit wild, which I love. Sometimes they're a little bit of a spicy salsa, which I also love. They are playful and they are so unconditionally loving. If you have kids, you know, it doesn't matter if you were in a crusty mood that day or if you were exhausted, they love you just the same anyways. They love you when you make mistakes, they forgive you. They are everything. And when I photograph kids, I just, I'm photographing them in a way that is a world I want to live in. I want every child to live in a world of magic. I want every child to have a place of honor and I want every child to feel like the special, beautiful creature that they are. And I understand that, you know, there are kids in the world that don't have a love-filled 
magic filled, amazing childhood. Not any of the kids that are pictured here. Um, they all have magic lives, but I understand that, you know, we come from, you know, there's trauma, there's abuse, there's neglect, there's all kinds of things, but I feel like children are the most resilient, beautiful creatures and we can learn so much from them. The father of this little peanut, um, he painted my house in back in December and he was there for five days. And the first few days, I mean, the whole time really, he was really quiet and he came in and he was always so cheerful. Every day it was like, when I asked him how he was, he was like, I'm so great. This is the best day ever. I'm glad to be alive. He was so hardworking. He would never chat for very long. It was like straight to his work, getting things done. And on the fifth day, the last day that he was there, my kids were home from school and my daughter was upstairs and she was asking him, she said, you know, she's super chatty. She'll like chat your ear off all day. And she was like, so when you were little like me, did somebody ever come in like this and paint your house? And he was like, no, I actually didn't grow up in a house. I grew up in a tent. I was a refugee. Whew, like right over her head. I don't think she understood. I've tried to educate them on, you know, that other people in the world don't necessarily grow up and live the way they do, but it was, it was kind of lost to her. And I was talking to him, the kids went to play downstairs and I was talking to him and he, he was telling me about his childhood. He grew up during the Rwandan genocide. And he said one of his childhood memories that, you know, was a big part of his childhood, the games that he played was, the kids would walk along the roadsides and they would see how many eyeballs they could collect from dead bodies and put them on sticks to see how many they could collect. And that is heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking to hear. For anybody who's never experienced that, we listen to that and we're like, holy, whoa. But for him, he grew up like that. That was the world he lived in. He was being resourceful. He was being creative. And that was a fun childhood memory for him. He says, I look back on that with nostalgia he doesn't look back on it with sadness. It was a fun thing, even as an adult, even though he understands that that's not normal for how we live in North America, he looks back on that with fondness. And I just think that speaks to the spirit of being a child and being resilient and making your own magic and making your own happy happiness with whatever the resources that you have. So when I photograph people, no matter who they are, no matter where they are in the world, whether they're kids, adults or whatever, Yes, I'm, I'm doing it in a whimsical way, um, but I'm doing it because I want to photograph every single human from a place of equality and from a place of beauty. And I feel like if I do so, I am elevating every single person that I photograph to a place of honor and I'm putting that back out into the world. So with that being said, um, I don't know where we're at for time, <laughs> but I have talked about storytelling. I've talked about, you know, the importance of using your voice and projecting back up into the world, you know, something that matters and something that means something. And I want to leave you with one more thought before I go today. And that is, it's not enough to create images. Well, it, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. But I would encourage you to turn them into something tangible and print them. And to encourage you to do that, I'm going to tell you one more story before I leave. And then I'm going to let you go. So I grew up on a farm, as you guys know, in basically what I consider the most beautiful little tiny slice of heaven in the whole world. My parents were living in downtown Vancouver and they were in real estate and flipping houses before they bought the land that eventually became my home. They moved from Vancouver to Northern Alberta to the middle of nowhere. We were 20 minutes from the nearest tiny, and I do mean tiny little village of just hundreds of people and an hour from the nearest tiny city. <laughs> and I grew up on hundreds and hundreds of acres of just massive beauty. My parents were into agriculture but not wheat fields and canola fields like you typically hear of being grown on the prairies. They experimented with things that we didn't know we could grow before. So I grew up with trees and shrubs and flowers and all kinds of fruit that we didn't know we could grow. And that is how I was raised. Just hundreds of acres of freedom and wild strawberry patches and wild blueberry picking and kittens running around the yard and sometimes like big old moose sleeping in the front yard when we woke up. And beautiful woods and decaying logs and fall leaves and 
arnica growing up out of the ground and bluebell flowers and lady slippers and magic, just magic. I was, I grew up off grid, so we had no electricity, no running water, simply because we were poor. We weren't trying to be trendy. It wasn't like the in thing to do. I think we were made fun of horrendously when I was little. Um, but I was raised, I don't know, I always say I was raised by the forest. I was raised by nature. I was outside building with my siblings and we were making tree forts and building platforms for each one. And at night we would just lay on the picnic tables under the stars and we would dream our dreams. And I was raised, I don't know, by nature and just with a really deep and profound respect for nature and the balance of everything. So I had such a, I had such a love, like such a profound love for my land and my home that I actually grew up with a really intense fear of leaving it. And I used to ask my mother if we would ever have to move. And she would say, no, we're not, we're not moving. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere. And I was like, okay, I can breathe. <laughs> you know, I would just ask her that occasionally just to ease my mind. Like, all right, as long as we can stay here, I can breathe. And one of my earliest memories was and my most frequent memories was when we came, when we went to town, which wasn't very often. I mean, I was bused into, into the nearest village to go to school, but actually going to the city, going to town was like probably less than a handful of times a year. We would pile into the Aerostar van and I would always stop as a small child. And I'm talking just little from as early as I can remember. And I would look out the window and I would look back over my house and my yard the, the little lawn and the big lawn and the trees and the farm. And I would just take a picture in my mind so that if we never came back, I would always remember what it looked like. Still blows my mind. I told you I'd cry probably at least three times. So that's time number two. Um, it still blows my mind just that I was so young, but I had such a deep connection with where I was raised in the earth, you know, the little slice of heaven that I was raised in and that, that's what went through my mind as a small child. And I remember my parents when I was eight years old, sat us down at the dining room table and they told us they were getting a divorce. And I didn't really know what that meant. I kind of knew what it meant, but the only question I can remember asking them as we sat around that plankwood table that summer day was, will we have to move? And my mom said, no, we won't have to move. And I was like, okay, all right. I can do this, I can breathe. And my mom was wrong. Life has a way of taking us down paths that we don't wanna travel. I've been down a few. And one day we piled into the van and we drove down that driveway and we never came back. Sorry, I promise that's the last time. Um, I went back to visit my farm after I lost my daughter. So nine years ago, I went back there. I had taken a break from my master's program that I was working on. I bought a camera. I used it to force myself just to get out of bed, go outside, look for beauty in the world every day. And I signed up for a college course at my local college and just to teach me how to use the camera. And the first assignment that we were assigned was a panorama landscape. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go back out to my old farm and I'm going to take a panorama of somewhere in my farm. And I got permission from the owners. It was bought by a really lovely couple who intended to live their own dreams there and retire there when they were done working. That dream never came to fruition because the husband died. So the farm ended up not ever being inhabited again, ever. So it was completely overgrown. Nature was starting to really take it back and the house was unlived in and everything was starting to fall apart and become dilapidated. And there was such a beauty in that for me. But I went back to visit and I took a picture, a panorama of our old greenhouse, the old greenhouse that I used to run barefoot through as a child. And I took it and I, that was my assignment. And I ended up printing it really big. Like, I don't remember how big, but several feet long. And I hung it in the neuroscience lab where I was doing research and it stayed there. And I connected with the professor that used to run that neuroscience lab last year. And he was, 
Guys, his name is Ali. He is the most magnificent, beautiful, incredible human. He's got more degrees than I can even count in more areas than I can even remember. His stories are like something out of this world that will leave you bewitched for as long as he will open his mouth. He is just this amazing, wonderful human. And I asked him if I could photograph him and write about him for a book I'm working on. And we were talking about, you know, just the old days when I was at the college. And he actually told me that the college where the neuroscience lab was lit on fire a couple of years ago. And that print of my old greenhouse got damaged. And he actually went and had it restored, which I thought was pretty much the sweetest thing I've ever heard. And um, asking him to kind of go back through his life and his collection of memories and experiences so I could write about him and photograph him inspired me to go back through my own and inspired me to go back to my old farm. So I asked permission if I could go out there. And last September, I made the trip out there and I took my kids and I took my husband. And while I was on that driveway that I used to drive down, I took this photo of my daughter in the most brightly, brilliantly colored tree that I could find. And I took it knowing that there literally isn't a single soul on this earth that would ever even come close to understanding what this photograph means to me. My little eight-year-old Noelle, who is pretty much a splitting image of her mother standing in you know, that driveway that I used to run up and down to go to school every day in this tree. And around the time that I took this photo, my husband took this cell phone photo, nothing brilliant, nothing with a DSLR, of just a snapshot of me standing with the kids in front of one of the old greenhouses, which is now almost completely taken back by mother nature. And I just marveled at it. I marveled at the change. I marveled at so many things, but I ended up sending this cell phone snapshot to my old professor, my mentor, the magnificent Ali. And I just said, you know, I wanted him to see how much it had changed from the panorama I took. And I said, it's, it's kind of a comfort that nobody ever lived here because Mother Nature did take this place back and because it remained untouched, I feel like it's still mine. Like my imprints are still here. The things that we left here are still here. That tin tub I used to bathe in, in the kitchen is still sitting out in front of the packing shed and it has a spruce tree growing through it now, but you know, it's still mine. Like our, thumb, our, our thumbprints are still here. And he wrote me back and he said something that actually just left me completely speechless sitting at my computer desk, like unable to even type a word in response for quite some time with tears on my cheeks. And I'm gonna read it to you because I don't wanna butcher it. He said, yes, I know how that feels. Those pictures I showed you are the only physical items I have with my mom's and dad's fingerprints on them. Once upon a time, they were held by their hands and their eyes gazed on them and they were kept in the drawers at the homes in which we all lived. And when I look at those pictures, when I look at and touch those pictures, I am touching people who have long gone, reliving in homes that no longer exist and transporting myself to a time that lives in memories. So I hope I have captured how you feel. If that is not profound, I don't know what is. And on that note, I, in the spirit of the service that we bring to the world and everything that we do for the people around us and the images that we take, and in the spirit of the magnificent Ali and his words, I would like to encourage you to leave something that pe people can leave their fingerprints on. That's it. Just create something that people can leave their fingerprints on, create something meaningful, create something valuable. Go out and change the world, do it in your own little way and create something that people can leave their fingerprints on. So with that being said, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this little talk and I hope you have the most incredible time at Imaging USA. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Dario. Thank you. Dario. Thank you so much, Cass. I'm gonna and go out of screen share. Your cast, you are using your voice and your work and your presentation today. 
will move so many that are tuning in, not just today, but in the, in the next few days over the end of the, the month here as that we replay this. And it'll help open up their eyes to, you know, in their photography and what's imp in, in important topics that you touched on today. The, there's power numbers, we know that. And the photography industry has the ability to work closer together to change our perception of body shaming and many other important topics. So I'm so happy that you touched on that today. And, and to help all clients appreciate having their family portraits taken, not just from the shoulders up or the chin up. So thank you for such an in, inspiring presentation. Thank you. I know every time you, you, you share your heart and you give it your all, you, you, your work, you, you put so much into it. I have to ask you, because I have some questions coming in on our YouTube live, where you are in the, the, the photograph with your, with the wings, how long did that take you to put that together? Well, the wings took like a month to build and feather, and that was done a year prior. And then the photograph was easy because I just mounted them from the ceiling. It wasn't easy, but I had to like disassemble my studio wall mount the wings from the ceiling, hang them so that they would hang there and look like, you know, I was wearing them, even though I wasn't, and then set up the scene. So I brought a bed in, set it up, like disassembled my son's bedroom, brought it over to the studio, set it up, set up all the kids artwork on the wall. So it took about a day. Um, and then the shooting took like seven minutes because my kids don't last very long. <laughs> and, and that is an important piece. I don't think most realize the amount of detail that goes into what you do. I mean, the, um, the photo with the newspapers on the wall. I mean, you, you have to talk just a second about that because that was incredible. I basically created, uh, with a friend of mine, Becky Kazel, um, I created a hundred years of headlines because I couldn't use old newspapers because of copyright. So we researched a hundred years of history there's five articles within each newspaper. So five major world events that I felt represented the time. And we did that for a hundred years and then created the newspaper articles. And then I hung them all from the wall. And Carl is a hundred years old. He's holding baby new year, our local baby new year. And the newspaper article on his lap, is, I created with a good side and a not so good side. So the good side is the future. The future is our children and what they are, the amazing things that they're doing in the world. And the not so good side was we were like threatening nuclear war or something at that point, like something ridiculous that, you know, kind of, you guys, we've been there. Like, let's move on. We can do better. Like, come on, get it together. So that's kind of what I was feeling. I was like, okay, the kids are the future. <laughs> they are going to lead the way. So that was kind of the concept behind that photograph. Well, so, like I have anticipated before, um, you know, I knew that this session would have been incredible because the, the care and attention and you know the the planning behind the picture like you said I, I moved the bed <laughs> I, I you know hang things and and Maureen you're right many things that you know editing means that you can do everything just like in a matter of a few clicks but it's not because all these masterpieces that I've been you know lucky enough to see printed properly and hang in, in contest everywhere are just amazing. And there's no other way than putting your craft in it. And sometimes it takes months, even just to visualize and conceptualize the, the, the idea and then to try to make it happen. But then when the magic happens, you can tell the difference is there. You can tell that each time I see one of your pictures, you know, and after your story today, I think, I think that I can understand better why you use some of the tones that I see and how much and how deep you love uh, these elements. And uh, I can breathe it, I, I can feel it, I can perceive what lies in between and behind. And that's exactly what your clients fall in love with. That's exactly the, the quest of each single photographer, in my opinion, whether you are a wedding photographer or a portrait photographer, newborn, uh, pets, whatever. Just, it's about photography, this incredible journey through people's lives and emotions and feelings. And then we have said million times, yeah, you know, memories are important, we need to print, but just the words that you used before, you know, leave something behind you that people can, you know, can leave fingerprints on top. That makes a lot of difference. And cast your sweet approach, 
your deep, you know, hard driven approach to photography. Yeah, of course you had experiences that forced and build your, yourself in the way you are. Um, but definitely as hard as life sometimes touch us, it's really, it's really about ourselves in, you know, understanding and figuring out how to use these, how to survive that and how to reverse it in, in a positive way. And, and there is no experience, no experience, positive, negative, or good or not so good, as you gently said, um, there is no experience that is meaningless. There is not. And photography is there to portray that moment and create a, you know, a milestone in everyone's life. That's, you know, I can't thank you enough to bring to, you know, for having brought today these incredible contents. Maureen, I'm, you know, I would talk for hours with Cass. I know, I know. Can you, can we show some of the dry mounts? Because we have so many waiting to see a sneak peek of what we've been working on with Cass. So this is the, the fine art dry mount. And then we we're working on a number of different substrates with Cass and, and testing them just absolutely gorgeous. And this is, this is your son, Cass. Yeah, that's my little guy. Um, there's nothing like seeing it in print. There's nothing like seeing your photos printed. Once you start, if you haven't started already, it is completely addictive. And there's nothing, for me, I love the fine art. I love the fine art prints. Um, they are so much more, like seeing, seeing Dario hold it up, I don't know if it's Dario or Dario. I feel like I might be butchering your name, but seeing you hold it up, it doesn't, the colors, the, the sharpness, the 3D-ness of it, you just don't get a, an impression of that until you see it in real life. My clients walk into my studio and sometimes they like literally walk in and like tears start falling out of their eyes because they're so overwhelmed. They're like, I didn't know it could look more amazing than what's on the computer screen, but like the computer screen can't even touch these. So yeah, it's pretty powerful stuff. It is. Do we have any others, Dario, to, to look at? I, I know I have mine in my other room, but if you, and, if, and for all of you tuning in today, if you go to the Graphy Studio closed Facebook group, you will see so many different examples that we've posted. And I'll make a point to post as well, because I, I know we have a lot of interest and, and this has been an active product that we're working on, right, Dario? We're yeah, 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 definitely. And now is the time to, to release it. And like you said, there will be multiple options. And I'm sure that each one will, will find the, you know, uh, the right fit, so to speak. And, uh, and you're right, Cass. When people see, see things properly, when, when there's a tangible feedback, it completely, you know, it's a completely different story because that's how our brain is wired. We work that way, and it's an amazing way. Mm -hmm. One of my clients wrote me one day, she sent me a message and she was like, I know she said, you probably don't need to hear this. And I'm not getting this absolutely correct. Um, just what I can remember from it. But she said, you're, she walks by the prince every day and they bring her so much happiness. And she said, they remind me that magic really does exist. And it exists in just our everyday lives and our children and, you know, the little things that we're doing. It's magic. And that's kind of, I don't know, she... She had a much better way of saying it. I, I wish I had her words in front of me that I could read them to you, but that's kind of how I feel about our pictures. They take us, they take us back to happy times. And we're creating magic. Mm -hmm. When this program is live and launched globally, there's gonna be a lot of portrait photographers that'll be doing um, flips because um, it, there's nothing like seeing your work in print and seeing your work in, in fine art printing. You know, it, it's just, breathtaking so i'm excited for that and that's coming and thank you for all you know tuning in today we're, we're broadcasting live from imaging usa and this will be live until the end of the month so we're really excited about that and excited about your time today so thank you so much cass thank you for having me thank you guys thank you cass thank you so much thank you thank you thank you ciao everyone yeah bye